Okay, so today's lesson is going to be recombination, gene linkage, and gene mapping. Gregor Mendel began his work in the 1800s, and he died in the 1800s. I think he was born in like 1822 and died in like 1884 or something like that. So his entire life was in the 1800s, and that's when he really made a lot of his uh, revelations. T.H. Thomas, or Thomas Hunt Morgan, what am I talking about? Thomas Hunt Morgan, he lived from the late 1800s to the early 1900s. And so he based a lot of his work on Gregor Mendel's um, literature and his research. Do you remember what organism Thomas Hunt Morgan used during his genetics experiments? Fruit flies, Drosophila melanogaster. Well, we talked about the red eyes being wild type and the white eyes being mutant type. But we're going to talk about two other traits today. We're going to talk about body color and wings. So to give you guys a little key, for the alleles, this allele is going to be um, tan color, and that's going to be wild type. And this allele is going to be black colored, and this is going to be the mutant type. This is for body color. For wings, this will be the allele for full wings. Wings that you can use to fly. This is wild type. And VG, without the plus symbol, is going to be <clears throat> vestigial wings. Partly, do you recall what it means to have a vestigial structure? What makes a structure vestigial? Uh, anyone? Risa? You don't need them? Do they used to have a purpose? Yes. Yes, but no longer do. Partly, do you have a, an appendix? An appendix. Yeah. It's on your right side. Do you have a third eyelid? No. Yeah, you do. No. We'll get to that in evolution. <laughs> do you use it? Yes. No, you don't. <laughs> uh, do you have wisdom teeth? Not yet. <laughs> I bet you do. They're just not. They're growing in. Yeah. Ha ha. You have them. I don't. I'm a mutant. <laughs> Um, do you have, and this is something y'all can do, check this out. Our ancestors used to be in the trees, and we still have a, a tendon that is actually, a tendon connects muscle to bone. So I want you to touch your ring finger to your thumb, and I want you to tilt your wrist forward. You see how that little protrusion right here? This is a vestigial tendon. Totally don't need it. It connects a bone to my um, carpals, my wrist. Totally don't need it. In fact, if I had to get some sort of tendon reconstruction surgery, this would be the first one they go for because we don't need it. It's left over from our ancient ancestors that are swinging through the trees. Some of you might have one. Some of you might have both. You could have one in your left arm, not one in your right and vice versa. Does anybody not have one in either? So you see, do you see this? That's a tendon. They don't have any you have a lot. You have a lot of tendons. <laughs> like, I have it right there. There's another one. It really sticks out. <laughs> so that is a vestigial structure. This one? You're not doing it right, doofus. I told you to do this. I know, but like, is it, is it that one? Now tilt your wrist forward. Not that hard. Yeah, that's it. Oh, okay. So I can see you without doing it, too. We'll learn this more with evolution. So Hartley and everyone else, a vestigial structure is a structure that once had a function, but it no longer does. If you look at the skeleton of a whale, do you know what you'll see near the rear? Legs. They have little leg bones. So what does that tell us about the ancestors for whales? They used to be on land. Yeah. Your tonsils are vestigial, too. You can live a perfectly normal life without them. Oh, I know. All right. So we have one fly.
we have one fly that has tan body and full wings. This is going to represent the wild type for both forms of the traits. Okay, so this little fly has this genotype. I need someone to tell me what would we call that genotype. And you just say B plus B, VG plus VG, get out. You don't call it that. Jasmine. Heterozygous what? Okay, you are correct. There's another way to say it. You could say double heterozygous. Um, you could say double hybrid. All are correct. So this is heterozygous, heterozygous. Or you could just say double heterozygous, double hybrid. It's all good. All right, now let's draw our other little fly. In order for this little fly to be black and have little shrimpy, useless wings, vestigial, what must its genotype be? Duncan? Or, yeah, double. Double homozygous recessive would be accurate. So here's what I'd like you guys to do. I'll give you a one minute. I want you to tell me, or write in your notes, all the possible gametes that each of these flies could produce. What is a gamete? <coughs> a sex cell. And in sex cells, do they have a parent's full DNA or half? So does that make them diploid or haploid? That is right. So they have, each fly has two traits for color, two traits for wings. I want you to narrow it down for their gametes, all the different combinations. I'll give you one minute. Starting now. Ten, five, done. Okay, for the tan fly, here are the possible combinations. You do the foil method. Dominant, dominant, that could be one like sperm or egg. Dominant recessive, that could be another. Recessive dominant, that could be a third. And recessive, recessive, that could be a fourth. Now, for the black fly, how many different combinations can it have? One. Very good. All it can have is this, because that's all it has to offer. This is pretty um, common in individuals that are homozygous recessive. So all that this little black fly with vestigial wings can pass on to its future offspring is a copy of the recessive trait for both of those um, traits. So I'm going to teach you guys another way that you can do a Punnett square. It looks like this. It's more like a Punnett rectangle. On the left side, you are going to have the one and only possible genotype for the individual that can only can have one possible genotype. And across the top, you're going to have the four different types for the parent that can have multiple variations of that genotype. YouTube. YouTube, right? You're going to watch on YouTube? Oh, yeah. Okay.
Okay, and then put them together for me. All right, there you go. Let's see, Reagan, can you tell me the phenotype for the first cross? Um, it would be tan body color. Very good. Casey, can you tell me the phenotype for the second cross? <coughs> Very good. Uh, Sophia, can you tell me the phenotype for the third cross? Very good. And Shane, can you tell me the phenotype for the fourth cross? Correct. Okay. If you were to number them, one, two, three, four, which two outcomes look exactly like the parents that were involved in this cross? Which two boxes produce a cross that is exactly like the parents? The first one and the second one. We would call this the parental phenotype. And the, this cross between, you know, the, the tan vestigial and the black full wings, which are not like the parents, we would call this the recombinant cross. They recombine. That's what the word recombinant comes from. And so what we're going to talk about today is how in the world did they get to be different than the parents? Why are they a different combination? If you have a blonde a uh, brown-eyed woman and a brunette, what did I say, blue-eyed man, you can have kids that are blonde and blue, blonde and brown, um, and vice versa, hair and eye can all be different colors. But how is it that you can have offspring look different than the parents? That's what we're going to get to today. Well, I want you guys to tell me, just based on expected <laughs> ratios, according to the number of periodic tables that are filled out, how many out of 100% would you expect to of the flies to look like the parents combined, both parents combined. How many flies combined would you expect to be tan and full, full, why does it full power, full wing, um, and black and vestigial? One half, 50%. And what percent would you expect them to not look like the parents? 50%, that's easy. Well, this is expected. Here's what Thomas Hunt Morgan actually observed when he did this experiment more than 100 years ago. Eighty-three to seventeen. Blue is mine. Why? Well, I mean, I could get it if it was maybe six to forty, but eighty-three seventeen. Something's not right, or at least something he didn't understand. And this led him to realize the actual event that takes place in meiosis that is critical to variation. It is called crossing over. So this led him to realize that crossing over occurs. This is a major, major event that takes place in meiosis. It occurs in prophase of meiosis one. 
prophase one of meiosis one. Be sure you guys definitely look up what we did before Thanksgiving break because that will be on your test. We talked about a lot about meiosis. So what crossing over does is portions of homologous chromosomes. If you're sitting at your desk like, what is homologous? You have some studying to do. Portions of homologous chromosomes exchange genetic information. This enhances variation in sexually reproducing organisms. I've been in plant for five years, so I've had students who are siblings. I've had sisters and brothers, and I can see some of my students, they look identical to their older brother. I mean, I, I, sometimes I accidentally call them their older brother's name because they look identical. And then I see two sisters where they have the same face, but one sister has really dark hair and the other sister had blonde hair, but they have the same face. So they have features that are similar, but then they have features that are different. That is because of crossing over. Sometimes you and your siblings inherit the same trait, and then sometimes you inherit completely different forms of the trait. But this enhances variation because um, variation is key to natural selection. It is very important. If we were all the same, then what's the point? When you guys have prom coming up in a few months, you want to go on, maybe you want to have a date. Maybe you might go stag, which means you're going alone. Um, but if you get a date, you know, guys, you've asked a girl to go to the prom with you. There's a reason you're attracted to her and not another girl. And, and girls, if a guy you have a crush on asks you out, you like him, there's a reason you like him and not that other guy. Because we all have our likes and our dislikes, and that's mainly because of variation. Maybe you like someone who has lighter, eye, uh, lighter eyes. Maybe you're just not a fan of brown, or vice versa. Maybe you prefer dark brown eyes rather than really light eyes. Whatever you want. Variation is key to natural selection because you're able to distinguish the haves from the have-nots. And what natural selection basically says is, is if your variations, your own little concoction of what makes you different from everyone else, if it helps you to survive, then you will find a mate, you will have offspring, and your offspring will be able to succeed because your genetics are successful. On the other hand, if your genetics really aren't that great, then you're not gonna find a mate or you're not gonna live or you're not gonna find food. And eventually the earth is going to spin just fine without you. And so there have been species across the millennia that have just been wiped out because they couldn't adapt or they couldn't find a mate or whatever the case may be. But um, variation is huge, it is so important. Well, when you have asexually reproducing organisms like bacteria, they don't have sex. There's no such thing as gender when it comes to bacteria. They just kind of do this, they, they split. Um, all they can depend upon when it comes to variation is mutation. Now we have mutations too. The reason why Hartley looks different than Sophia is because she has mutations that she doesn't have and you have mutations that she doesn't have. That's one reason. But the bigger one that's way more productive is crossing over. It, every generation is gonna be different than the one that came before it. And so what I want to illustrate for you guys today is how crossing over happens and also how sometimes Gregor Mendel's law of independent assortment has a exception to the rule and it's called linked genes. So what I would like to do first is I want to show you how sometimes crossing over doesn't matter when you have an individual like this black fly with uh, vestigial wings. So as you can see in this fly, it has the same alleles. You all said it can only make one type of a gamete. Its gametes will definitely have the black body gene and its gametes will definitely have the vestigial wing gene. So let's just see what happens when crossing over really doesn't matter. So here is a diploid cell and gold star, if any of you can tell me, what do we call, what type of cell is the diploid cell whose destiny is to become a sperm or an egg? Hannah? It is called a germline cell. Very good. 
It's a diploid cell. And diploid means it has a full copy of chromosomes, which means there are two chromosomes per pair. So here are our chromosomes. And this little stripe, which we call a band, has the recessive B, or the black gene. <clears throat> and then these bands down here have the vestigial wing gene. Now, where do we inherit our chromosomes from? Our parents. So this fly has parents. Let's say that the chromosome on the left is from mother, the chromosome on the right is from father. What do we call these chromosomes who have the similar traits that pair up? Very good. They're, these are, this is a homologous pair. Another reason why Thomas Hunt Morgan chose fruit flies is they only have four pairs. So it's actually pretty simple. So tell me first, what happens during S phase of <clears throat> interphase? The DNA replicates itself. So the chromosomes from mom, they just doubled. They are going to be identical. And the chromosomes from father, they are going to replicate too. Now, here's where the magic happens, everybody. Let's say that this cell is currently in prophase one. Prophase one is the first stage of meiosis one. Now, <clears throat> let me ask you this. If this portion here and this portion here, if they, if they uh, flip flop, they go like this. This is all that has to be done by a case by case basis. In this particular example, will it matter? Why not, Duncan? You immediately shook your head. They're the exact same. Duncan, if I had a dollar bag of Doritos I got from the vending machine, and you had a dollar bag of Doritos from the vending machine, they're both unopened, and I say you want to trade, do we really get a different bag? No. So this is a case where crossing over does not matter. Is crossing over still going to happen? Yes. Will it matter that it happens? No because the individual has the same traits on both the maternal chromosomes and the paternal chromosomes. So we will say crossing over happened. You're not gonna be any different for it, All right? So let's go through the rest of meiosis one. And that one parent cell is going to separate into two daughter cells. Oops, here we go. See it flip-flopped. I'm just drawing that to indicate that it did happen. Okay, and then we're gonna go through meiosis two. Crossing over only happens during prophase one. It does not happen in prophase two. I'm sure you know that. Okay, these will be your gametes. They could be little sperm or they could be little egg. How many chromosomes do these gametes have? All, the same number as the diploid or half? Half. Who will provide the other half? Because let me tell you, there's somebody in fourth period. They're sitting here like this. 90% of human co communication is nonverbal. Here's her last period. And I, and I told her, all right, you got it written all over your face. What's wrong? She goes, why does each cell only have one copy of the allele? 
And she didn't realize, so, well, these are gametes, right? Yeah. It takes two to tango, sperm and egg make two. And she's like, oh, okay. So that, if you're curious, if you're thinking that in your own head, that's why each cell only has one copy of the allele. The other parent is gonna provide the other half. These are future gametes. These could be little eggs or these could be little sperm. Now, that is for the fly that was a true homozygous recessive. Let's do it where we had the fly that was homozygous, or excuse me, heterozygous for both traits. This is where you definitely will see how crossing over changes the potential outcome. All right, so here's our germline cell. And inside our germline cell, we have a maternal chromosome, we have a paternal chromosome. We have the location of the genes, which I'll get to momentarily. Here's the dominant and dominant. Here's the recessive and the recessive. So let's say this dominant one's from mom, the recessive one's from dad. So they, this fly is heterozygous for color and heterozygous for wings. What happens during S phase of interphase? Hmm? The DNA replicates. And so, we're gonna have two copies of the chromosome with the dominant trait. And we will have two copies of the chromosome with the recessive traits. Now, what happens in prophase one of meiosis one? Right, this is where you guys will see that it happened. This portion of this chromosome is gonna switch spots with this portion of this chromosome. So they're going to switch um, locations or they're going to switch chromosomes and so here's what we get well let's uh, go through meiosis Okay. Notice that they flip-flopped. And so now, I want you guys to zoom in. That chromosome right there on the left, it is dominant, dominant. It has both dominant traits. But now look at the one on the right. It is dominant and recessive. We now have variation. We have a combination of a dominant trait and a, header, uh, a, a recessive trait on the same chromosome. You look over here, you have recessive and then dominant. And then over here, you have recessive and then recessive. This is what is creating variations. So we finish off meiosis by going through meiosis two. And so here we have four unique gametes. The one on the hard left will be a true wild type. The one on the left center will be a wild type mutant type. The one on the right center will be mutant type wild type. The one on the hard right will be mutant type mutant type, a true mutant. So 
what Thomas L. Morgan realized is A, this happens, and B, if I scroll back up here, why was he only getting 17% and not 50? Because he realized that, some, that there are some genes that are so close on a chromosome that they are going to be passed on together. It's like, if you guys want my watch, <coughs> do you have to take my shoe too? No, because they are so far away. But if you want my shoe, are you gonna have to take the tongue of my shoe? Yeah, they're together. It's a package deal. Sage, you all right? You know, you got a bug in both eyes and you're trying to suffocate it. So this is what led uh, Thomas on Morgan to realize that linked genes are why he only got 17% instead of 50-50. Some genes are located so close to each other on a chromosome that they are inherited together. For example, most redheads have their red hair gene uh, linked to the freckle gene. They're together. And so you typically see one with the other. Now, am I going to say it is 100%? No, because I just had a student last period who has red hair and not a single freckle. It happens. But we're going to go with the majority, not the minority. The odds are that, these two uh, that those two genes are linked. So when it comes to flies, it turns out that tan color and vestigial wings are pretty close together, so they're linked. So that's why he saw the majority of the, of the flies, 83%, either look like the tan normal wing parent or the black uh, vestigial wing parent. And he, didn't, he only saw 17% that had a, a half and half because these genes are linked. They're so close together. It's like you can't have my shoe unless you take the tongue of my shoe. You can't have my finger unless you take the fingernail too. Yeah. It does violate the law of independent assortment. So this was something that he noticed that Gregor Mandel didn't catch, is that this does contradict the law of independent assortment. The law of independent assortment states that traits are inherited without the influence of other traits. This is the yeah, but to that. There, in science, there's almost a yeah, but. Don't sensationalize the yeah, but. Sounds like my mother. Mom, you're going to start, you're going to get cancer from smoking. Yeah, but, you know, I could get by bus tomorrow. Okay. So, um, one other term I want to introduce you guys. I keep saying the location of a genome chromosome. That is called the loci. This is simply the location of a gene on a chromosome. That's that little gash. Yeah, that little band, that would be the location of a gene, that would be the loci. <coughs> you kind of see that they got that word from location. Okay, so the, we've done linked genes, we've done recombination, which is crossing over. Let's get to our last part for today, and we're making good time. Let's talk about gene mapping. Gene mapping is a verb. It's an act. And you may see this on the AP exam. So let's say that we have a chromosome. This is what they look like. That's a chromosome, okay? And on this chromosome, we have three genes. And we're gonna identify the recombination frequency of those genes. So I'm gonna give you guys an easy one, then we'll give you one a little harder where what I'm gonna ask you to do is based on their frequency of recombination, I want you to 
identify where they're located. So we have VG, which is vestigial, but, and B, which is uh, color. Then we have VG and CN. CN means cinnabar, which, are, which is eye color. It's kind of like a dark red color, like bricks. And then we have cinnabar and body color. The recombination frequency of VG and B is 17%. VG and CN is 8%, and CN and B is 9%. What are you supposed to do with all these numbers? So I'm going to give you some clues. Number one, the genes with the greatest frequency are furthest apart on the chromosome. Furthermore, they are most likely to cross over or recombine. Okay, so let's not overload you at the moment. Can you guys tell me which two genes, you got V, G, and B, V, G, and C, and or C, and, and B, which two are the furthest away from each other? And the way that you determine that is which one has the greatest recombinant frequency? Which ones? VG and B. So we're going to make them as far apart as we can on this chromosome. So I'm going to say VG is here, and we'll say B is right there. So now let's look at VG and CN and CN and B. We need to put CN somewhere. So VG and CN are 8% um, or 8 gene mapping units apart. And CN and B are nine gene mapping units apart. So which one would be closer to VG? Uh, excuse me, what would CN be closer to, VG or CN? All right, CN is going to be just a hair closer to VG. So let's put it right here. What is the distance between, or how many mapping units are there between VG and CN? And that, to answer that question, you would just look at the percent. So when I say how many mapping units, what's the percent? That is eight. What about between CN and B? Nine. And what about VG to B? 17. Eight plus nine is 17. So... If you want to know which genes are furthest away from each other, you need to identify which one has the greatest chance of recombination. Ayla, you all right? No? Yeah. I don't know. Now, the other one, the other fact. The genes with the shortest distance, or with the, um, the genes with the lowest frequency, are closest together. They are most likely to be linked. And what that means is it's not impossible that they could be crossed over, but it is more likely that they're going to be linked and they're gonna be passed on together. There's only an 8% chance that VG and CN are going to be recombined, which means there's a 92% chance that they're going to stay together. All right, so that was an easy one. Let me give you one that's just a tad harder to finish out today's class. All right, we have our chromosome. Genes. Recombination frequency we have A A to B thirty percent B to C forty five percent B to D forty percent and A to D ten percent. 
which two traits are furthest away from each other? B and C, 45. So we'll put B here and we'll put C here. That's a 45 mapping unit difference. Which two are the second closest, or excuse me, the second furthest apart from each other? B and D, that's right. So let's put um, D right about here. And then we have A, the distance between A and B is 30 and A and D is 10. So where should I put uh, A, closer to B or closer to D? Let's put it right there. And so uh, this is going to be kind of a trick question for you. Not really a trick question, but it's going to be a tricky question. The last two AP classes have gotten it wrong. Let's see if you guys can break the trend. The distance between B to C is 45, right? The distance between B to D is 40. The distance between B to A is 30 and the distance between A to D is 10. Which two genes are the closest together? Yes, bingo, D and C. What is the distance between D and C? Five. And so those two genes are linked or let me put it to you this way. They have a 95% chance of being passed on together <laughs> a 5% chance of being recombined. So let me tell you what happened earlier today. This is an exact type of question you might get on the AP exam. Hold on, give me 10 seconds. It might ask you which ones are closest and what, you, what the people in first period did, they just looked at the list and they go, oh, A and D. No, 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 no. It was D and C. So you got to look all over, not just at your lists.